my soul is stirred in this moment. God has truly blessed us with incredible gifts through these individuals who serve week in and week out. And I know because I've spoken to some of you very specifically about this this week, we are so grateful. Thank you, entire uh, worship team. Cedric, thank you for that last song. And Dwayne, we're gonna have to add Cedric to that Gold Line concert with uh, Lauren and Andy. Two quick pieces of uh, family news, family business before we uh, jump into the text today. One, please be aware if you are a family, uh, a week from today on the 22nd, look for information both on our website or in the newsletters, but our family ministry team has a, a drive-through Advent uh, event so that we might lead our children and our homes into the presence of Jesus over this upcoming Advent uh, season. And so please mark that information and come and get your supplies. Second, on Wednesday, our nation uh, honored and celebrated veterans with Veterans Day. And some years we make mention the week before, some the week after. Quite honestly, the text today seemed much more fitting to just recognize those of you in this congregation who are veterans. Um, if we were live and in person, we would ask you to stand. We would recognize you for your service and sacrifice. And so uh, on behalf of your family here at Lake Avenue Church, or if you're visiting with us and you happen to be a veteran, we are very grateful for your service. Uh, Scripture tells us uh, that one of the, what we can see from our Lord Jesus is when, we're, when we lay our lives down for others, it's that ultimate sacrifice. And your willingness to serve and what you have gone into in your time of serving is so deeply meaningful. And for those of us who benefit from your service, we say thank you. And in fact, the message today will be in James. I think there's a lot of lessons we can learn from those who are who have served and who are serving. It's essentially what James is going to be talking about and what we'll be investigating together in the word is how do you make plans for the future when the future is uncertain? Sound fitting for the lives we're living right now? How is it that as followers of Jesus, we are to think and plan for the future, especially in moments which we could say all moments, where the future is not certain. If 2020 has taught us anything, I think it's one of these major lessons, is that as much as we can plan, as much as we have ideas, as much as we have uh, uh, what we're going to do this next year, um, we really don't know. We really don't know. And so, would you please join me for the reading of God's word? We'll be in James chapter 4, verses 13 to 17. If you're able, please stand. Now listen, you who say today or tomorrow we will go to this or that city, spend a year there, carry on business, and make money. Why, you do not even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if it is the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast in your arrogant schemes and all such boasting is evil. If anyone then knows the good they ought to do and doesn't do it, it is sin for them. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. So, James very specifically is speaking to some business folk, some people within the community who uh, have more means than others. In fact, this is going to carry on in, in what follows in James chapter 5, where James is, is really drilling down on those with, uh, with wealth and with income, and specifically talking about some of the traps that come for people 
um, who are successful. And so what we can see right away is that James is speaking to a group of people who are business folk, who have a business plan, who have anticipated what the next year is going to be like, and in doing so, so confident in their business plan that they declare and they presume that what they say will happen. And while that context is very specific to James, and I believe for some of you, because we are blessed with business folk in this church, stay in that context for you. But I think what we will begin to see is that each one of our contexts, we do similar things with God. We do similar things with the way we think about our time, our lives, our future. And so we really need the word of God to speak to us today. This is a very straightforward sermon. There are three sections, three sections, and within each section, a point that James is trying to make. And the first thing I want you to see is really the title of this sermon. The title is The Problem of the Personal Pronoun. And right away in verses 13 to 14, we see the pronoun problem. Now listen, you who say, today or tomorrow, we will go to this city or that city, spend a year there, carry on business, and make money. Why, you don't even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. So I wanna, I wanna deal with this pronoun problem with first verse 13, then verse 14. So in 13, listen, this is the, you who are saying and you're putting out there, here's what the business is going to do this week. Again, the specific context is those in this time who are uh, merchants, who are traveling, setting up shop to make their money and make their profits. Now, I want to be clear really on the front end. What James is not saying, he is not anti-business. And he's actually not anti-planning. I think we can look at all kinds of Proverbs, other scriptures that talk about stewardship and preparation. So, so don't hear these words as James saying, uh, the business field is evil and you should never make money and don't even worry about a business plan. That's not what is happening. Uh, what James is declaring is listen to the perspective of these folk. I am going to do this. I am going here. I am selling this or that. And I am going to make a profit. I. I. Here's where I'm going, here's what I'm going to do, and here is the outcome of my hard work. Here's what I'm going to do and how much I will make this next year. Essentially, what James is speaking to are those who, cre who are creating and living their own individual story apart from tapping into the larger story that God is writing. These are people who are declaring what their life is going to be without any input, with any, without any access, without any um, submitting to maybe what God wants for their life. Lives that are full, perspectives that are formed, trajectories that are set without any room for God. This kind of perspective puts the self, puts me, myself, I in the main, as the main character of my life story. Self-reliant, self-made, self-led lives. And this is where the context hits each one of us, doesn't it? Self-reliant, self-led, self-made, declaring uh, yourself as the main story in your life, you as the, the key to executing the kind of life that you want, sounds to me very Western, very American in many ways. And I have said many times from this pulpit over the years that pronouns, especially first person personal pronouns, ought to be problematic for those of us who follow Jesus. First, personal, first person personal pronouns, the use of I, me, my, mine, those should come with tension for us at times as followers of Jesus. Because how do we reconcile what is mine when I say I'm nothing and I've given my life to Jesus? Or Jesus says, uh, take up your cross daily and follow me, deny yourself. 
We have teachings throughout the Bible that say when we uh, follow Jesus and we make him the main story of our life, we die to ourselves. And so continuing to use the me and mine and I, especially in terms of things like possessions, things like time, things like outcome, that should be problematic for many of us. Now, I, I'm not the first to suggest just because I can declare to you that pronouns are problematic for the follower of Jesus that somehow I have mastered this. I am in my own journey with the reality of the pronoun problem. So, so how does this work out in our context? One, if you're a business person and you got a business plan, I think if you put your plans together, without leaving room for God to do what God's going to do one way or the other, or to, to submit those plans and those outcomes to the Lord so that when success happens, you see it as from God himself. And when something doesn't happen, that God might have something else for you. Where is God fitting into your, your venture, your job? I think as a youth pastor in Pasadena, California, being a part of this congregation for a long time, I think there's a, another way this plays out, especially in our families. A way that it plays out that I judged for years and now having a 12-year-old son, let me admit to you, I understand the temptation. And it goes like this as a parent to a child. Here is what my son's gonna do. Here's the grades he's gonna get. Here's the schools he's gonna go to. These are the options he will have for college if he just does these things. When he gets to college, these are the internships he ought to take. This is what he's going to do. And for him to have the life that his mom and I have sacrificed and worked hard for and think that he is gifted for, just follow this plan. It's why I've seen over and over again one of the most um, uh, mind-blowing parts about how often in our culture for some families, obviously with some kind of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of uh, some kind of influence, some kind of means where you have the, the thought that my, my child will go to college. It's just so fascinating to me how rarely these Christian families, and I'm not judging because I'm there, weigh the options of where my child is going to go to college without prayer, without researching, what are the churches or the ministries that are part of that campus? How we can prepare to make sure they have every toiletry in the world for college, but we can ignore the reality of their spiritual life in college because we have a plan. And as a parent of a 12 year old, I understand, I get it. I don't judge it, but I see it in the same context here. So whether it be Kids, students, your own plans for your life that you're certain about and that you're just following the script. And if I just do these things, then I will do this. I'm going to go here. I'm doing this. I'm becoming that, leaving no room for God to influence, to change, or to direct. Parents, if we do this with our kids, grandparents, if we do this with our kids, this is the context that James is speaking about. And it is a pronoun problem. The text will tell us that when we live this way apart from God, that we become arrogant in verse 16, it goes as far to say that this kind of self-directed, self-reliant living is sin. James continues, you don't even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Sounds biting, doesn't it? I almost see a reality show happening here where there's a conflict between two people and somebody who has a little more insight says, you don't, you're nothing, sit down. I think it's in that context we might be tempted to hear James. You don't even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You're a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Sounds biting in a cutting way. I don't think that's how James is pastoring us. I think he's saying something different. Listen to it. Can you, can you read this with a little more sincerity with James saying, do you even know who you are? Do you know who you are in comparison to who God is? Do you understand uh, in, in the grand story of what God's doing that your life is just a mist of vapor? And so you spend all this time concerned about this thing. And in the meantime, God's holding so much more I think it's pastoral. I think it's warm. If you know who you are, you wouldn't feel the need to control your life in the way you are. You would realize how not in control you are 
and that as we sung earlier, freedom is available. James is writing to help us find freedom, not receive a reprimand. James is writing to help us have the right perspective. And we have so many more moments in the Bible that build upon verse 14 specifically. I mean, we know in Jesus' teaching, Sermon on the Mount, therefore do not worry about tomorrow for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. James is going to continue this theme of daily living. Daily living with God, with God, in relationship with God. Proverbs 27, one, do not boast about tomorrow for you don't know what a day may bring. James says that our lives are but a mist, a vapor. In this brief life that we have, there is a bigger story to connect to versus writing a very small story of our own. The smaller story is but a mist, a vapor that will go as quickly as it came. James is beginning to help us have a different perspective away from the self-reliant, self-controlled way of seeing our lives seeing our futures. He continues this by offering in verse 14, a second point, a second aspect of the story, calling it the corrected perspective. So we have the pronoun problem, the self-reliant life. And James begins in 14, continues in 15 to give us a corrected perspective. When he says, instead, you ought to say, if it's the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. What James is saying is leave room for God. Acknowledging God in the day-to-day -day and in your future plans to live or to do this or that is essentially honoring the Lord as the Lord. It's recognizing that everything we have, every moment, every minute, every success, every failure is within the Lord. Recognizing his larger story as bigger than our own individual stories. And that our little story fits beautifully within his larger story in, in the larger sharing of his word, his will in this world. So again, in the context of business folks not leaving room for God for the future, to this James says, leave room for God in your plans and know that only the Lord knows the future. You know, our church has a significant partnership with a church in Lebanon. Many of you have gone. My wife has gone twice. It is a constant part of our prayer life at home. And, and talking with her this week, I re, she reminded me that when she is in Lebanon, some of the things that stand out to her about the way Christians speak out loud is that anytime they're talking about future plans, all plans, whether it be for that day, for that week, they always end talking about the future with God willing. And when they refer to the past, refer to something that happened that day or yesterday or anything in the past, they always say and point up, thanks God. See, this is why we need to recognize that our brothers and sisters across the globe have much to teach us. Because that kind of perspective is the corrected perspective. It's recognizing that when we talk about the future, God willing, and when we talk about where we've been, thanks God. It recognizes the Lord in every moment and it honors the Lord as the Lord of our lives and our time and everything. So that brings up one question because essentially what James is teaching is to trust in the Lord's will, God's will. And, and, and when we talk about God's will, in fact, I had a conversation this week. It's, it, that's a hard concept for us to wrestle with sometimes. It's God's will brings up issues of God's providence. And so I just want to take a road really quick to address, one, that those questions are really valid. Some of the most common questions I get as a pastor have to do with what is God's will for my life or in this world? And how do we understand God's providence, especially in, with the reality of evil in this world? These are major important questions and I'm not gonna do them justice in this moment. Please reach out to a pastor or someone who has been following Jesus a little bit longer than you 
But I want you to understand, especially when it comes to how do we understand God's providence in light of evil in this world, and how do we understand God's will for my personal life and choices, that, that there's some history we stand on that kind of um, is, is, continues to be built in theology. So Augustine, way back when, he says this about God's providence, that God permits evil to occur and uses them to accomplish the divine purpose. God exercises sovereignty over evil by bringing good out of what it by itself is only negative and destructive. That's kind of some of the earliest thinking around God's providence in light of evil. Calvin goes on to say that God, God governs the course of nature and history down to the smallest details. Well, that can be encouraging when uh, those details are wonderful and benefit the world or benefit me. But what do we do with the, the details of, of the destruction, the death, wars, horrible sin in this world? And I have been reading more and more in the last couple of years um, a theologian named Daniel Migliore. And, and I love how refreshing his perspective is. And he uses Trinitarian theology and he argues that we mostly can come, we come to know God most clearly through the life, cross, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. So what does that mean when it comes to understanding God's will and God's sovereignty? One, recognize that God's, when, when James says, and when we talk about submitting to God's will, that is an active, not an idle way of understanding God. So when we say it's the Lord's will, that, that doesn't give us the opportunity. We don't take our foot off the spiritual faith gas and go, well, whatever God's going to do, God's going to do. The Lord's will and the reality of the Lord's will should make us active, not idle. Active, pursuing God's word, God's ways, sensing leads from the Holy Spirit. How is it that we are, because we have been invited to participate with God in the outworking of his mission, the outworking of his will in this world. So when you hear James say, you're nothing but a mist and a vapor, instead you should say whatever the Lord wants, that doesn't mean hands off and just let it all happen. It means press in. And sometimes when we press into God, there's, there's two realities. Yes, there is a yielding and a patient part of that. There's a yielding and a patience that says God's power is bigger than any of my power. And as much as I'm going to lean in and try to understand what God is doing in this moment and how I might be participant, uh, participant in that, there are moments where we, we are patient and we yield to God. And yet there's also times where we're activated and, we're re and we are part of uh, being resistant to the evil forces in this world. See, uh, God's will sees darkness, sees death. And through the resurrection of Jesus, we understand that restoration and hope and healing are a part of God's will in this world. And there will be plenty of times where followers of Jesus, it's not our job just to see evil going on. Well, it's, this is what God ordained. And it, 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 he's got it under control. No, we, we're activated and we help be part of hope, restoration and resistance in the forces of evil in this world. So when James says, instead you ought to say, if it's the Lord's will, we will live or do this or that. When we include the Lord in our days, our plans and our futures, we are saying something to make our lives activated with God, not lazy with God, activated with God. And in that activation, what we're saying is we recognize him as Lord, we leave room for him to show up in our lives and plans and change them. We move toward him and his word and his ways, seeking his will. We see God's providence as higher than our plans. We submit our plans to his will, at times requiring patience for his power to lead, and at times being activated to live the lives we're instructed to live in Scripture. Romans 12, 1 and 2, one of the most known verses around God's will. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Activated, moving towards God. And when we move towards God, verse 2, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. The problem with the personal pronoun puts me in the middle as the main character, 
the author of everything, the corrected perspective gets us right where we sit underneath the lordship of Jesus. And what I love about James, he doesn't just call out the pronoun problem, offer us a corrected perspective. He concludes with some very concrete, practical teaching. In verses 15, 16, we're calling it the daily choice. As it is, you boast in your arrogant schemes. All such boasting is evil. If anyone then knows the good they ought to do and doesn't do it, it is sin for them. Uh, Theologian Scott McKnight talks about the main sin that James is talking about in the beginning, the sin of presumption, presuming that you can control outcomes in life. And, And what James follows up with here in 15 and 16 is the sins of omission, not doing what we know we ought to do. So how do we live if living with presumption is a sin? Well, first we have to recognize that when we presume, when we go out and and lead self-reliant lives away from God's influence and under his authority, that is sin. That is arrogance. Found in a very practical and personal part of verse 17. When you know the good you ought to do and you don't do it, you are sinning. God's words, God's word and God's ways is attempting to shape us over a lifetime for obedience. It is a journey. The the, the life with Jesus is a journey. It is an adventure. It is a lifetime And I think what we can gather from both James and from the rest of scripture is there is so much we cannot fully know and know exactly in this journey, but there are things we can know. And what James is saying in verse 17 is here's what you, here's what you can know. You can actually know the good you are supposed to do. You are, you are actually able to know the good you are supposed to do today. See, in this longer journey of obedience with God, there are daily opportunities to do the good that God puts in front of us, right in front of us. A personal pronoun gets in the way of this, doesn't it? How, if, if, if we're living for ourselves and our self-reliant lives, and we're not including God into the way we execute a day or plan the future, it's really hard for us to see the good that he is, the opportunity for good that he is putting in front of us living crowded lives with no room for God translates to no room for others and no room for the good to be done. My dear friend from my doctoral program, Scott Kenworthy, he's a pastor at Owensboro Christian Church. He is an incredible preacher. And he was preaching this text not too long ago when he says this, and I want you to see it Lake Avenue. When as followers of Jesus, we allow tomorrow's plans to interfere with today's opportunities, we have exchanged obedience with arrogance. When as followers of Jesus, we allow tomorrow's plans to interfere with today's opportunities, we have exchanged obedience with arrogance. It's a daily choice for you and I to do the good that we ought to do. How how does that work? Well, How can we apply this? First, I I think one of some questions you ought to ponder with the Lord, with others, with yourself. And the first one is where in your life do you need to release personal pronouns? Is that car yours? Is that bank account yours? That kind email that somebody sent you saying you're pretty amazing, is that because you really are amazing? How do you see yourself in light of God? How do you see your life in the midst of God's story? You're just a mist. Releasing personal pronouns might be a great start for some of you. Second, who can you talk to with, who can you talk with more about the daily choice to do the good you ought to do? Are your future plans louder than your daily obedience? Are your future fears bigger than your faith? On Friday, I'll tell you and conclude with this story because it hit home very clearly on Friday night. I'm blaming my mom for starting to talk about Christmas because I'm getting the calls. 
what do what is what does Jenny want? What do the boys want? I'm like, I, I don't know. We're trying to live one day at a time, but somehow I got sucked into the trap. And on Thursday and Friday, I started thinking about Christmas. And as many of you know, I, lo- I love to shop. That's, that's kind of my gift into our family. And I have all these ideas. In fact, Jenny got home from work. I got home from work Friday, went for a walk. And the subject of the start of our talk was some gift ideas I had for the boys. Boys, earmuffs. Um, we just reorganized their rooms and the process of that. And so it had to do with making their rooms look kind of cool. And, and, and this would be the budget. And then I, I kind of made a proposal if we buy that kind of now and then wait for the next things for uh, we do here. And I had it all mapped out, had the whole plan on how we could get these things for the boys and, and the future plans of how we could make that all work financially and, and, and it would be great. And that night we were invited um, previously in the week to a fundraiser, an online fundraiser, um, uh, uh, for, for Hillsides, which is a group home. Uh, it's over 100 years old. I, I'm familiar with Hillsides. Uh, it's a residential living uh, situation for kids that uh, are having a tough time or, or, or are orphaned. Um, and, and we were part of this fundraiser online. And it was one of these very Pasadena things where it was very fun. We learned how to make a charcuterie board and, and they had a bunch of juices I think we were supposed to taste. Um, and, and, and then, you know, it's fun, everybody's laughing, everybody's having a good time, we're enjoying it, and then uh, they come and speak at the end. And I know this is coming, here's the pitch. Here's the way we can participate with this nonprofit. And, um, and it was so brilliant how they packaged the need. Each one of these kids who, who doesn't have a family, who will not wake up in a home, like the home I have for my kids on Christmas, they really go out of their way at Christmas to really bring the Christmas experience to these kids. So we open up this thing, and I've got a name, and then I look on the back of the thing, and it's got all these things these, this kid wants. Adds up to a certain amount. And then, if you want to go above the amount, what they really like to do is provide some new bedding so that there's a kind of a reset for the year. It was, it was beautiful, and the dollar amount was near exactly the dollar amount that I had just a few hours before said we needed to spend on our kids' rooms. And then this text started screaming out to me, am I not going to do the good thing that God's put in front of me today because I have a plan to do it tomorrow? Am I going to add um, what would be nice for my kids at the cost of what's needed for someone else? And, and, And here's the beautiful thing about... And many of you know this, I've learned it from you. The beautiful thing about allowing God to teach you how to do the good thing today is when you follow his leading and you obey, there's no loss. I'm not sad for what my kids might not have. And the truth is, I can probably still get them those things. But see, if I would sit in that moment and go, wait, we just did the math two hours ago. I mean, we've got to take care of us. We, we've got to take care of these boys and, 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 and their Christmas. If I have a self-reliant life, I, get the, I miss the moment to do the good thing today. Lake Avenue Church, I believe that those kinds of opportunities sometimes are financial. Sometimes they're not. Sometimes they're about our time, our priority, Sometimes it's about doing the good thing we know we ought to do, but those opportunities come all of the time. And when, as followers of Jesus, we allow tomorrow's plans to interfere with today's opportunities, we have exchanged obedience with arrogance. We have said, no, my way of living is more important than what you're asking me to do in this moment. I don't know what the good things are, that God is going to put in front of all of you this week. Some of you, it's literally going to mean to bring in the trash cans for your neighbor. Some of you, it's going to be, I'm, I'm not going to watch as much TV because I need to pray more or to be in God's word more. For some of you, and this is not a political statement, the good thing you can do today to wear a mask when you go out and you can't social distance. I don't know what the good 
thing that God is asking you to do each day. But I pray, I pray that as we die to ourselves, deal with the pronoun problem, get the corrected perspective and submit to God and his word, his ways, his will, boy, that we would see more and more daily opportunities to live out the faith that God calls us to. And you will not regret that kind of obedience. Before I pray, Lake Avenue Church, is it possible, just possible, that one of the many things that God is teaching us in 2020 is that we cannot control much. You can't control your time, your schedule, your plans. I think, Dwayne, aren't we on eight options right now for Christmas Eve? Keep trying, we could do this, we could do that. And as difficult as some of those options when they don't work out look like, I sense, sense God's still got a good thing for us to find and to do and to be. If we've learned anything in 2020, I'm wondering if it means, at least for our church, that God is so deeply desirous of us being in daily connection with him so that, so that when we declare what we're going to do, we might be able to end it with God willing. And when we celebrate and think of the good that has been done in a day or the wonderful moments of the day, that we can say, thanks God. Father, thank you for these moments we have shared. Thank you for your word that speaks so clearly to us. I pray for myself and my brothers and sisters that this next week we might learn more and more what it means to die to self, that we might receive that correction, that new perspective, so that we might experience the adventure of daily living with you. I pray, Father, that the good you have asked each one of us to do each day, that we would see it, we would acknowledge it, and that we would do it. In Jesus' name, amen.